before we start, let me acknowledge that we meet here today on the lands of the, the traditional lands of the Nunwal people. I pay my respect. We all together pay our respect to their ancestors um, and to Nunwal people present and past, and to all the Aboriginal people and Torres uh, Strait Islands uh, people who are present here today. <coughs> Mr. Toppe was born in a small village in the Har district of Bhutan. He is uh, the eldest of six sons from his family. His father was recruited into the Bhutanese army in 1950s. He was among the first uh, of uh, fish, uh, first Bhutanese men to enlist in the standing army of Bhutan at that time. His mother also worked on the first modern road that was built between Bhutan and India at that time. So both his parents had a seminal role to play in the development and expansion of Bhutan um, at that time. As he grew up and finished his schooling, he got a United Nations scholarship to go and study abroad. And he went to the uh, United States, where he obtained a Bachelor of Science in Engineering degree at Swanson School of Engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. That was in 1990 when he graduated. And soon after that, he joined John F. Kennedy School of Governance at, uh, at John, John F. Kennedy School of Government, rather, at the Harvard University, where he completed his degree in Masters of Public Administration in 2004. Mr. Tauke then uh, returned to his native Bhutan and started his career in public service as a program officer in the technical and vocational education section of the Department of Education. He held this position for five years before taking on the role of officer in charge of TBES. From there, Mr. Toke established the National Technical Authority, or NGTA, and served as its director, uh, overseeing the quality of vocational teaching in Bhutan. In 2003, he became director of the Department of Human Resources for the Bhutan government's uh, Ministry of Labor and Employment, a position that he held for four more years. Then came a change in 2007 when Mr. Toke resigned from the, from, from the public service to pursue a career in politics. He was a co-founder co of the People's Democratic Party and established it as Bhutan's first registered political party. He then ran for the parliamentary election in 2008 as a, a candidate for PDP and won one of the only two seats that the party won in the 47th <coughs> seat house. That brought the resignation of the then leader of PDP and opened the door for Mr. Toge to become the leader of PDP. <coughs> Mr. Park Toge then continued in politics and 2013 brought him to the seat of the Prime Minister of the country as uh, right after the election. During his time in politics since then, he has focused particularly on the problems of youth employment in his country, corruption, and national debt. He is recognized for putting a focus on ending corruption within Bhutan's government and for his close personal interaction with the people of Bhutan. And you can see that from the presence of many uh, people of Bhutanese origin, that he is very close to his people. In his role as the Prime Minister of Bhutan, Mr. Toke uh, actively promotes the University of Canberra and a partnership with the Royal Institute of Management, which is, of course, situated in Bhutan. <coughs> he has also been a staunch supporter of the expansion of University of Canberra's activities in, in Bhutan. In fact, just before coming into this room, he asked me when we were opening a campus in Bhutan. <laughs> In his personal time, he's a busy man. He has many interests. He enjoys volunteering, reading, trekking, archery, and music. Quite a diverse set of interests. He's also a prolific blogger. And very recently, he gave a TED talk where he spoke about the key to happiness. Sherry Toke is married to Toshi Dong, and they together have 
to children. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister of Bhutan, Mr. Thakke, to the podium. I remember that day clearly, 18th July 2008, when I heard my name announced, I got up carefully, deliberately, because I was shaking. I was nervous, made my way up to the table, held a pen, and signed the Constitution of Bhutan. 18th July 2008, the parliamentarians, newly elected parliamentarians, put ink on paper and brought into effect the Constitution of Bhutan. I was shaking, I was nervous, I was scared that I was going to be overcome with emotion and that I would black out. The emotion that I would have felt <coughs> was not because of rejoice, not because we had a constitution at hand. But because I remembered clearly that our ancestors, 100 years ago, 17 December 1907, signed another document. At that time, a document bequeathing power to a hereditary monarch. 100 years ago, our ancestors, the people of Bhutan at that time, came together and gave the power of governance to one man, who became the first king of Bhutan and gave him the powers to establish a hereditary monarch. 100 years ago, the people got together and handed him the power because our people were fed up of unending civil strife that plagued our country for a continuous 250 years. And so our people got together and signed the historic Genja, a contract giving the powers <coughs> to a man and empowering him to establish hereditary monarch. During that hundred years, we've had him rule our country, and then the second king, and the third king, and the fourth king, and then the fifth king. During those hundred years, Bhutan experienced a golden era of peace, prosperity, progress, and happiness. After a hundred years, I felt that I was betraying our ancestors by taking away power, by signing the constitution, and therefore taking power away from an institution that has given us, the people of Bhutan, so much and kept so little for themselves. <coughs> Our constitution is unique. His Majesty wanted to introduce democracy. The people said no. His Majesty insisted in introducing democracy. 
and the people were reluctant. And so his majesty the king drafted a constitution. A constitution when it began, when the drafting process began, had nothing to do with democracy. It was going to be the mother of all laws in the kingdom of Bhutan. But slowly and surely, without public knowledge, as the constitution drafting process evolved, democratic principles and parliamentary democracy was introduced into that constitution. That constitution is unique. For one, it is one of the shortest constitutions in the world. It has just 35 articles. Number two, our constitution clearly defines the roles of our king, of our monarch. And what's interesting is there are provisions in the constitution that require the king to be 21 years of age before he assumes the throne. And the king must retire, abdicate at the age of 65. You don't think of kings belonging to a profession that have to think about retirement. But the constitution requires our king to retire at 65. Our previous king, the fourth king, he's already in retirement. He was 51 when he retired. What's more, the king can be impeached by the people. If he were to violate any provision of the constitution, our king is subject to impeachment. Number three, the Constitution has an entire article in preserving and protecting our culture. And it's working as you can see today. So many of my friends here wearing our national dress, the Koa and the Kira. Number four, our Constitution has an entire article on environment. And this must be the only Constitution throughout the world that devotes an entire article on the preservation of the environment. We are required to maintain by law 60% of our land under forest cover. Today it is 72. We are required by law, every citizen is required by law to assume the responsibility of protecting and preserving our environment, not for ourselves but for our future generation. And the state the government is required by law to ensure that enough funds are set aside for the protection of the environment. Number five, the members of parliament must be qualified. <coughs> like most other countries, our members of parliament must be <coughs> citizens of the time, but they cannot have any criminal record, none whatsoever in the past. They must also be at least 25 years of age. And they cannot be above 65. <laughs> and they must have a university degree. All this makes unique qualifications that are required to, be, to stand for elections as an MP. The government is designed in such a way that, that uh, sorry, the Constitution provides provisions that make the government stable. As a small country, this is important. It does so by several means. One, you can have only two political parties in the National Assembly. You can't have coalitions. So we have two rounds of elections. The first round of uh, primary elections is to choose the two parties. The second round of election is for the two parties to contest for seats in the National Assembly. So at any given time, you will have only two parties in the National Assembly. That makes the National Assembly stable. The National Assembly is made even more stable because you cannot defect. Members of Parliament cannot defect to the other party. What's more, the National Council, the Upper House, is made up of independents. They are non-partisan. And so are our local governments. They are also independents. All that makes 
governance in Bhutan a lot more stable. A stable government does not mean that the government can gerrymander, can revise, change borders so that they can win the next elections. The constitution requires a three-fourth majority of a joint sitting of parliament, not just the lower house, which has two parties, but even including the upper house, which has 25 members, all independents. We need to get a three-fourth majority to change the boundary of any constituency. And finally, there's gross national happiness. Our kings have given us gross national happiness, a development philosophy that focuses on the holistic development, that balances material progress with social development, <coughs> that balances economic growth with environmental protection and cultural preservation, that focuses on good governance. The Constitution requires the state to promote the conditions for gross national happiness. So these are some of the areas that make our Constitution different, quite unique in fact. But the people were not convinced. We didn't want democracy. Our people said no to democracy. And I can tell that by three different, by giving you three different examples. Number one, after the constitution was drafted, our king took the constitution to the people of Bhutan and discussed the constitution. Our king distributed the draft to each and every household in the kingdom and went from district to district to district to discuss the constitution. Everywhere the king went, People pleaded against democracy. We didn't want democracy. We couldn't trust political systems. We couldn't trust political parties. And we certainly couldn't trust politicians. Everywhere the king went, people said, why do we have a provision in here that requires a king to retire at the age of 65? Why can't we continue with the tried with a system that is tried and tested and that is serving our country so well. Number two, we had a mock election in 2007. To prepare people for democracy, we had a mock election. And in that mock election, we used colors to represent different parties. So we had green, the green party, the blue party, the yellow party, and the red party. And when they went to vote, this was a mock election to train our people to vote and to choose a political party. Our people chose the yellow party overwhelmingly. The National Assembly has 47 members. 46 went to the yellow party. <laughs> and in Bhutan, yellow represents monarchy. In spite of that, His Majesty the King persevered. Continued to convince the people that democracy is the best form of governance for Bhutan. That no one person can guarantee progress of our people. And so he persevered. But something else happened. Nobody came forward to start establishing political parties. It was already late in 2006. And no one, not a single Bhutanese stood up and said, I want to start a political party. So in February 2007, after giving it much thought, and not discussing it with my wife, because she would never have agreed that in my resignation. I resigned from the civil service. I was the first civil servant to resign. I felt that His Majesty's King must be obeyed. We have a saying in, in Bhutanese, a king's command is heavier than a mountain. 
when implemented. But if squandered, it is more precious than gold. And so I tendered my resignation and decided that I would join politics without a clue of what that meant. So I hastily got together a team, prepared some logos and party name. We called ourselves the People's Democratic Party, and then got a logo of a horse. And then we made some posters and uh, hurriedly put some uh, principles and charter together and uh, announced what we stood for. And then I went throughout the country and distributed these documents. And then I asked who I considered to be capable people who understood the command and the vision of His Majesty the King to join me and start the political process, to start the People's Democratic Party. We identified candidates. Some of them were doctors, some of them were engineers, some were lawyers. All of them were very qualified as required by the law. And we were ready. But there was no other party coming out. And finally, one party emerged called BPUP. And then another party emerged called APP. And then they joined forces. And a third party came about called DPT. And then all three of these parties joined forces and merged as one party. And yet, they were not able to put together a political party. We were sitting pretty because we had done all the work. <coughs> In 2008, we had an election. As many as almost 80% of our registered voters turned out to vote. The results, 45-2. We got only two seats. The other party got 45. <laughs> we got a walloping <laughs> when we thought we were going to win. And that was my first lesson in democracy. What I learned was that our people were already trained in democracy. Our people may not have wanted democracy, but they knew what democracy was all about. They knew because our king, who's our fourth king, had already trained our people. In 1981, His Majesty the King decentralized powers to the districts. In 1991, he decentralized power even further to the villages and made people elect their representatives. In 1998, he decentralized authority to the elected cabinet and required the National Assembly at that time to choose who they wanted as ministers. <coughs> so our people understood the process of voting. We didn't know that the country was being prepared for democracy. We were not only being pre prepared, our people had been trained and trained adequately. And the results showed. 45-2. I was shocked. I was shocked, not really at the results, but because as a member of a two-member opposition, I couldn't figure out how I'm going to discharge my duties. I was scared, because as a member of a two-member opposition, how do we ensure that there is enough checks and balances to prevent an all-powerful government from undermining the very principles of democracy that we were participating in. So I worked very hard, as hard as I could. I questioned the government, perhaps a bit too much. I wrote a lot. I maintained a blog, perhaps a bit too critically. I engaged in social media, and I toured the country, and met local governments, a non-partisan, that were non-partisan and made up of but I wasn't alone, because the Constitution of Bhutan provides checks and balances. For one, the National Council, the upper house, is made up of independents. The 25 <coughs> members, they don't represent any political party. 
the local governments throughout the country are also non-partisan. And then there's the media. Our media was vibrant, and they were critical. Anything to do with corruption, they wouldn't hesitate to write about it. Any policy that the government implemented that the media felt were not in the best interest of the people, or that the people didn't support, the media wrote about it again and again and again. And finally, I needn't worry, because the overall check and balance was provided by His Majesty the King. Not by his royal action, but simply through his royal presence. He provided the conscience. He provided the inspiration. And he reminded everybody, including politicians, both government and opposition alike, that we must be true to our vision of achieving cross-national happiness. And so five years down the line, we had another election. And this time, the incumbent government, they were prepared. They had their missionary oil, well oil. They had all the candidates. And my party, the People's Democratic Party, we were struggling. We were scrambling to put ourselves, the team, together. We had two rounds of election. In the first round, the primary round, was to choose two parties. We managed to get through, along with the incumbent ruling party. The second round of election, we campaigned hard, we worked hard, but like I said earlier, the ruling party was a lot more organized, had a much more bigger organization, and we thought had a lot more support. <coughs> About 70% of the electorate turned out to vote. The result, 32-15. We had won. And in 2013, we formed the ruling party. And the earlier ruling party now sits in opposition. So as I discharge my responsibility as a member of parliament in the ruling party, as a member of the executive, as a prime minister, I am reminded over and over again the lessons of the lessons that I learned after the first election and the second election that never to take our people for granted. Our people understand what democracy is about. Our people understand democracy because they have been trained in democracy by none other than our beloved kings. So as I discharge my duties and as I serve my country, I am reminded to ensure that in democratic Bhutan, the rule of law prevails. To ensure that in democratic Bhutan, we must provide equal opportunity for all so that inequalities are not excessive. And that in democratic Bhutan, we cannot and must not tolerate corruption. But most importantly, that in democratic Bhutan, we will be true and faithful to the ideals that have been gifted by our beloved monarchs to us, the ideals of gross national happiness. Thank you very much for your kind of
I'm, not, I'm actually going to open it up to questions throughout the audience as well. So prepare your questions. I'm only going to ask one or two short questions to start, and then hopefully we can have a sort of big fireside conversation rather than a very small one. Um, but Prime Minister, um, the democratic paradox that you talk about in terms of people not wanting democracy but very much supporting it um, is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> Those of us who visited groups have experienced that every time we go, that people talk about how they don't want democracy and then they engage. But um, I suppose the question I've got, which I've never understood in group time, but which I think fascinates me, is given how clear the Constitution is around um, the environment, measuring the price, national happiness, and so on, what are the big dividing points that the parties fight over um, in, relation, in relation to trying to win the votes from people? <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> and uh, the simple answer is the political parties do not have very strong ideological divides. We have not differentiated ourselves one from the other ideologically very clearly. And I think the answer to that or rather the reason for that must be that we also don't want democracy. We never wanted democracy and we still don't want democracy. Remember, everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world, people have to fight for democracy, bloodshed for democracy, and they have memorials for democracy. In Bhutan, we were given democracy, it was imposed to us. We didn't want it. We didn't want to start political parties. Now, everywhere else in the world, whether it's a new democracy or an existing democracy, when you form a political party, you have an objective, you have a vision, you have an idea, an idea that will lead to a better system, a better country. In Bhutan, we form political parties for what? to contest elections for nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> to breathe life into democracy, our new democracy. Because you couldn't have multi-party democracy without political parties. So we had to form political parties. And we formed political parties, but none of us had any entrenched ideology except to carry on the good policies of our kings. And this is why it's very difficult to even today differentiate the policies of one party with the other. <laughs> I'm not sure that any Australian political parties are not differentiating. <laughs> uh, if, I, if I could just stay with political parties for a moment, then, because in most developed democracies, one of the challenges for political parties is their funding, how they're funded, and then how they um, in, at the same time, re-engage with those people who are funding them or those who they want to vote. Um, quite often from membership systems. <coughs> so how do political parties, or particularly your political party, work? Just to give us, not necessarily a, um, a statement of why your party is the best, but just why, you know, how do the parties work in order to engage people to understand why they should support the party and to get the support that they need to develop. In case uh, you're thinking of contributing, <laughs> <laughs> we cannot accept funding from foreign sources. <laughs> if we do, we will be debarred. We will be deregistered. Funding is very interesting. Uh, the state provides funding for campaigns. And they set limits also on how much the party can spend. So spending during political campaigning cannot be excessive, in excess of what the state provides you. So uh, that's the funding part during campaign. Uh, to run the organization, we have membership fees, and then we have voluntary contributions. And voluntary contributions, we have a cap. Uh, you cannot give more than the ceiling that the election commission 
uh, in those days. <coughs> so uh, we haven't been receiving too much voluntary contribution. Uh, and even if they were, they, they wouldn't be allowed to exceed uh, the cap that's imposed. My experience for my party is that you really don't need as much money. Volunteers, people are willing to volunteer. You don't need too many offices. You don't need to be entrenched uh, at the grassroots level. You don't want your presence to be felt everywhere. And for that, you really don't need much money for operation. And I say you don't need uh, presence between elections. Because I think our people don't like that. Our people don't want political parties. It has become a necessary evil for democracy. And our people really don't want political parties and to be associated with political parties. And I think, I think uh, the stronger a political party is, the last two elections have shown that, the bigger the chances that, uh, that they're going to lose and lose by a big money. <laughs> That's a great answer. I'm um, going to take you to something else that's sort of um, interest, I think, in most modern democracies, which is um, gender equality. And I know that a bunch of times discussed about this, um, but one of the concerns I would have um, without knowing the um, demography of the term is that if you have a requirement for all politicians to, to have a degree of tertiary qualification, does that debar really more often than men? What is the challenge of um, gender equality with the economy? Yes. Uh, <coughs> the qualification criteria does not favor women because you need a degree. It does not favor women because there are fewer women uh, in our colleges and graduating from the college system. <coughs> Bhutan is gender equal traditionally. In fact, most men would say it is unequal because women are preferred. Uh, many places in Bhutan are matriarchal and uh, uh, property is handed down from mother to daughter, not from father to son. When modern education began, people who were powerful, the aristocrats, didn't allow the children to attend school because school meant sending a child away to a boarding school. And they kept them at home. They suffered because they didn't go to school. Uh, we went to school. Uh, parents <coughs> sent their sons to school, not their daughters. Not because they thought that the daughters would do, a son would do a better job, but because they didn't want their daughters to go through the difficulties in a boarding school. As a result, in the early days, most of the school had all uh, generally more boys and girls. And that uh, uh, translated to less women in colleges. Today, in the school, it's about 50-50. So we've reached there now. But in the colleges, uh, we have some way to go. It's about 40-60. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, we didn't even have that ratio. And as a result, there are few, far fewer women eligible to participate. That said, in every other sphere of life, whether it is uh, driving taxis or uh, being uh, <coughs> or uh, doing uh, business, our women are excelling. And you can see here in the audience also that uh, so many uh, of these women, uh, many of them would be here on their own accord. Uh, and they are independent, they are strong, they are capable. My guess is that in the next uh, election there will be more women, and in the subsequent election there are going to be many, many more women. Right now in the, uh, in the lower house, in the National Assembly, of 47, uh, we have only four women, and that's a few. And so one of our campaign promises was to institute a quota system. We, we, we said, if you elect us, we are going to require that 30% of all elected positions are women. No, said no, the women. 
So the moment we tried to initiate discussions on this, the women said, absolutely not. This is demeaning. This is beneath uh, us. You are undermining the potential of women. We will educate ourselves, and we will earn the positions in the parliament by ourselves. I, again, I just want to get some sense of, given the absence of ideology that you talked about before the political parties, so what, could you give me, um, I don't think you're to think about this, but you've been in office now for three years, um, just over three years, I think, actually. Um, You're reminding me. <laughs> yeah, we'll have two years to go. Um, when you go into the electorate, you'll have to talk about what you've achieved. What's the thing you think you will feel would be most successful? Prime Minister through your party in terms of achievement whilst the government. Other than your business showing up. Well, I'm laughing because you're giving me an opportunity to campaign here. Yeah. <laughs> you're serious, yeah? I am. <laughs> there are also moments for scrutiny in my It's not fair. We need uh, uh, my, uh, my, my colleagues from the opposition here also. Uh, they would uh, certainly disagree. Hopefully would disagree with many of the things I say. Uh, one of the first priorities of a government was to stabilize our economy. Our economy was going through a very difficult time. Our loans were skyrocketing. We had currency uh, account problems current account problems. Uh, most of our trade uh, uh, was and is with India, and yet we, couldn't, we didn't have uh, enough uh, Indian rupee reserves. Uh, uh, economic growth was stifled. Uh, it was uh, in 2013 when we took over, it was the lowest uh, in years, 2.15, was the lowest in several decades. And, uh, in two years, now it's three years, we've turned it around. Uh, our debt is under control, except for hydropower, which is an investment, uh, commercial investment. Other than that, uh, we've uh, brought down overall borrowings. Uh, the, the current account situation has improved. Rupee is freely available. Loans that were curtailed earlier are now made available. Imports that were banned because of uh, economic problems were quickly lifted, and uh, all these problems uh, that plagued us, that threatened us uh, when we took over, that threatened the entire country, uh, have now been solved. In addition to that, uh, we've now managed to lower interest rates, borrowing interest rates, uh, because our banks were charging uh, excessively. And so through the, our central bank, we spoke with the commercial banks and they've all lowered interest rates, which means that for productive activities we can now borrow more money and uh, we can uh, produce more and therefore thereby contribute even more to the economy. Uh, but there, in, the, in the area of uh, uh, the economy, some very simple things also. So for instance, we have Bhutanese who do some part-time work in Australia. They work very hard, they save money, and they don't have a way of taking their money back home. So recently we've allowed uh, people working outside to operate foreign currency accounts in Bhutan. So they can send hard currency, uh, Australian dollars in this case, to Bhutan, and they can maintain uh, their accounts in Australian dollars, and they can withdraw Australian dollars from their accounts. So these are small measures. Anyway, one part is the economy where we've made, we've sta not just stabilized the situation, but we've made huge gains. This year, 2016, the IMF, the IMF's World Economic Outlook ranks Bhutan number three in terms of economic growth in the world. Our economy, by their measurement, by their assessment, IMF is, not ours, is projected to grow by more than 8.13% this year. So this is on the front of the economy. The other is rural development. So we've focused our attention on uh, two parts in terms of rural development. Uh, one is decentralization, because we believe 
that we must empower local governments because local governments are those that deal every day with the uh, problems uh, of the people and can deliver the aspirations of the people. And so we are uh, devolving more power and authority to the local governments. One way is by giving them block grants. Earlier, the central government would decide what money to give to the local government, for what purpose. And local governments had to use it for that purpose. But we've given them block grants. Uh, earlier, it was every Geo group of villages would get uh, 2 million dirhams a month. Uh, beginning this year, in addition to that, every Zonkak is getting uh, 7 million dirhams a year. And then in addition to that, uh, Zonkaks are now have authority for uh, human resources development uh, by, uh, on average, of about 5 million uh, terms a year that they can, they will decide uh, in what areas they can, uh, they want to use the training uh, budget for. But in every geo, we uh, we are taking, uh, we are improving the roads. We are building new roads where roads don't exist and we're improving the roads. So every Geok center has a black top road, road, uh, uh, road that is sealed with asphalt. Uh, every Geok center has a farmer's shop uh, where farmers can buy produce at uh, reasonable prices, but more importantly, where farmers can sell their extra produce. Every Geok center, every Geok has a Geok bank so that our farmers can engage in the modern banking system. Uh, every uh, geok has a minimum of five power tillers. These power tillers will be distributed to the geoks. And every geok is being given a utility vehicle. So we built roads, but there are no vehicles. And so every geok is being provided with one utility vehicle. All this is to make living in their geoks, in their villages, uh, uh, to make living more uh, better and to be more, more attractive. Otherwise, without these interventions, uh, life in the village is going to be very difficult and more villages are, are going to end up in our cities. Farming. So we've been focusing on farming, on animal husbandry. We've been providing electric fences and we've been providing greenhouse uh, uh, greenhouse, greenhouses uh, to uh, improve the productivity of agriculture. We're going large scale in terms of encouraging our farmers uh, for husbandry uh, and for cash crops. The whole idea is to give our villagers, our farmers, access to income. Because without income, no amount of government service is going to uh, improve their prosperity level. Our kings have given us education, a system of free education. So we've now we have too many schools and we can't focus on the schools because our resources are spread too thin. We don't we'll never have enough teachers because we have too many uh, schools. Some of the schools are in extremely remote areas. So we are bringing the schools together and starting something called central schools where our students are being provided not just food, the textbooks, the clothes, the shoes, the only, uh, uh, what we require from the students is that they will also work hard in the school uh, until they graduate. So this is to improve the quality of education. We've been improving the roads, the whole road network from the east to the west, we're widening it and improving the quality. It'll be done by next year. And once that's done, it's going to be the economic lifeline of most parts of uh, interior Bhutan. Improved uh, connectivity in terms of air transport and domestic airlines, but especially uh, through helicopter services. Uh, these are just a few of uh, 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 what we've been doing. Uh, one big area is to stimulate the economy, we are focusing on small businesses. And to do that, we started a scheme what we used to call the Business Opportunity and Information Scheme Center, now renamed the Rural Enterprise Development Corporation. Renamed because 
there was a lot of objection to the legality of the institution. So we've incorporated it as a public company and they provide subsidized loans uh, to all the farmers throughout the country and to our youth uh, to, uh, to start uh, cottage industries. So these are just a few of uh, what I would tell our voters back home. <laughs> So, if I was still in the opposition, I would be criticizing you for the bilateral coverage that the Rose and Hobbs and the Rose and School and so on. No, I'm not going to do that. Why can I just throw it open to some questions in the audience? I think Tim here will run. I'll just hand you my microphone, so. Very quickly, because I don't have time to patch on. Tim Fisher, full marks to Bhutan, the progress they've made, and a great set of meetings today. Parliament House, Prime Minister, Foreign Minister. Prime Minister, USA, the President recommends nominations to the High Court, they go to the Senate, the Senate eventually gets around to considering them and they get adopted or otherwise. In Australia, the Attorney General consults with the states, brings the nomination to the High Court of Australia, Supreme Court of USA, High Court of Australia, uh, to Cabinet, goes to Governor General and agreed or otherwise. How do you appoint your five Supreme Court judges in uh, Bhutan when they come up to their retirement ages? We have a judicial commission. The members of the judicial commission are the chief justice of Bhutan, the senior most uh, judge in the Supreme Court, uh, the chairman, the chairperson of the legislative committee uh, of the National Assembly, and the attorney general. So they form the Judicial Commission. They will make their recommendations to His Majesty the King direct, directly. It doesn't go through us. And then His Majesty the King will appoint them. Thank you. Excellent. Question over here. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for your presentation. I've been to Bhutan twice and both times I've been extremely impressed by the beautiful environment you have. I think it's a biological paradise. But like all environments, they come under pressure. So I'd like to ask you what you and your government see as the greatest environmental threat for that beautiful country that you have and what you're doing to address that threat. The greatest threat is global warming. Climate change, but especially global warming. Global warming because of pollution, greenhouse gases, uh, going to destroy our mountains, our glaciers, uh, it's going to make fresh water less sustainable, uh, it's going to cause flash floods and widespread destruction. That is a major concern. What can we do about it? Precious little. Because the cause of global warming is not from the time. It's from the outside. Uh, but I have said that we cannot not do anything. So what we will do is continue the good work in terms of environment. Like I say, we are carbon negative. Now the world is hearing the term for the first time, carbon negative. You know, of the 200 countries in the world, not one carbon neutral country, not one carbon neutral country. There are few countries, uh, one of the Nordic countries, that is uh, Costa Rica, yeah aspiring to be carbon neutral, which is good. They're not carbon neutral. Not one of our countries is carbon neutral. And in Bhutan, we are not just carbon neutral, we are carbon negative. We are a huge carbon sink within the country, and we are offsetting millions of tons of carbon dioxide outside our country through the export of renewable energy every year. Now, we must talk about this. It's important to talk about this because if a small country, a landlocked country, a country with just 700,000 people, a country with a GDP of barely $2 billion, if we can do this much, the rest of the world must also do their part. So on the one hand, directly, so carbon, uh, sorry, uh, global warming and climate change is our main concern. What can we do about it? Nothing directly. But indirectly what we can do is showcase to the world what we are doing, even though we are a small country. 
And through our example, our hope, our, asp our aspiration is that larger countries, richer countries, more well-endowed countries will also join the fight against climate change. I feel like I'm in a question now. I, I attended the question now in Parliament today. <laughs> but it's much more friendly here. <laughs> Thank you very much for this amazing speech that you gave. And I have two questions for you. The first question is, how can you, I'm a, I'm a history at the University of Canberra, and how can you measure the happiness in people's lives? Because happiness is something very relative. Your happiness could not be my happiness, or your wife's happiness, because she wasn't happy to see you go to the politics, for example. <laughs> so, so that was the first question. And the second question is, I'm originally from Africa in Congo, uh, where people are fighting for their life, daily for the democracy. Listen to you, I feel like you come from another planet. So what sort of, 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 um, of value can you give to us, to, 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 to Africa, where the world is still the, 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 uh, growing and people are still dying and fighting for democracy? Thank you. Thank you very much. You're from Congo. Yes. What we can give you? <laughs> and, and your first question was, why am I not making my wife happy? <laughs> happiness, there's happiness at the personal level. What makes me happy is different from what makes you happy, right? Uh, and then there's immediate feeling of happiness, it's temporary happiness. Uh, and on the other hand, there's long-term happiness, more sustainable happiness, call it well-being, call it contentment. Now the definition of well-being, you could debate, but by and large it's the same. And so when you measure happiness, when you talk about happiness, you're not talking about a stand-up comic in front making you laugh and you're feeling good. Because the moment you exit, you're going to have forgotten about it. This is important laughing, yeah? But you will have forgotten about it. But what is happiness? Is knowledge that is rule of law. What is happiness is that there is good governance. There's equity, there's fairness. What is happiness is knowing that not just you yourself have equal opportunity, but your children will have opportunity regardless of how rich or poor they are. And they all will enter the same school and more or less get the same attention from the government. What is happiness is the knowledge that you can walk into any hospital in Bhutan and get free consultation and free medicine. And if our small hospitals can't treat them, they'll be sent to India to undergo specialized treatment. What is happiness is a sense of security knowing that if you live in a rural farm and you break your, you fall off a tree, or as what's been happening recently, you are mauled by a bear, you can telephone and get a helicopter to rescue you, free of cost. Those are the underlying elements of happiness. Now we measure happiness every five years. We have a happiness index to measure happiness. And they don't measure, did you laugh, you know? <laughs> uh, 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 do you have somebody in the family who is the a designated joker? Uh, but, but they will ask questions like, uh, how much time do you have for yourself? How much time do you give for spirituality? You know, how, Women give it the same amount of opportunity. And are women as happy as men? <coughs> and the last uh, survey showed that the women were not as happy as men. The last survey showed that the people in rural Bhutan are not as happy as the ones in urban Bhutan. And it is our job as a government and the NGO, the society at large, to respond to those findings. But they also ask citizens about the awareness for the environment and their participation in culture. 
So you can see our Bhutanese all uh, uh, wearing a national dress. This is important for us because we, this defines us. It is uh, maybe just superficial, but it is important for to define who we are and hopefully for what we stand for. So these are elements of happiness that are measured. How much time you spend in your community? How are you aware of the festivals, your local festivals? So these are things that are measured in the happiness index. So when you say, how do you measure happiness? Uh, if you want to measure happiness, the Center for Bhutan Studies and GNH Research uh, can sit with you and it will take them at least two hours to go through the questionnaire. At the end of the questionnaire, I can't imagine anybody would be happy. <laughs> but, but they will ask you 101 questions and that's what they do in their sample. They go from person to person to person. The last sample had more than 8,500 respondents throughout the country, a random sample. And they trained people to interview and to collect data. Because measuring happiness is complicated. And happiness is serious business. What can we contribute to Congo? I, I don't have a clue. But what can Congo contribute to the world? I heard one day, I have the deepest respect for Congo because I love music, all types of music. And I heard one day, I read one day, that the source of some of the most beautiful modern music in the world, whether it is reggae or hip hop or jazz or blues, the very source has been traced back to Congo. That is what you have given me and the world, and I can't thank you enough. You are accessible to your Prime Minister. He asked me. I said, why not? It's not a surprise for me. I have I shook hands with my Prime Minister two times. This is the second time. <laughs> One was back in 2008, I was graduating, just finished with my bachelor's, and I said to him, not even just Prime Minister, I shook my hands with my king, His Majesty, uh, more than two times. And I even had a <clears throat> tea with His Majesty. So what I feel is, this is one of the uniqueness which I find here, that being accessible to the people. Not just the Prime Minister, but King. I think this is one of the uniqueness in our country. Now, coming straight forward to my question, here is, uh, uh, during my course of two stay here, two years stay here, I found most of my international friends, like us, Australians, they are very adventure lovers. They save a lot of money go to New Zealand and most of the European tours. And my question here to our Prime Minister here is like, what is your message to them? Since I think tourism is one of our country's booming economy apart from hydropower. So what is your message to them? Thank you. The message to Australians traveling to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> like most of the Australians, they are very keen to come to Bhutan, but I think very few Australians have been visit, have visited Bhutan, and they want to have a channel. Yes. So some so of my message to Australians traveling to Europe about visiting Bhutan. <laughs> <laughs> message to Australians who are eager to visit Bhutan. Yes. <laughs> First. Uh, thank you for posting our picture on Facebook. 
and thank you for shaking my hand. <laughs> Our country has just 750,000 people. Of that, about 130,000 people are foreigners. So we have about barely 600,000 people, 620,000 people. Our strength is our numbers. We are small, and we should be connected to one another. We should shake hands, not just once, but twice. <laughs> because there are so few of us. We can do that. Australians can't do that. But there's so many. And certainly Indians can't do that. Chinese, forget it. <laughs> Two hundred and fifty one thousand people voted in the last election. About Seventy percent participated. Two hundred and fifty one thousand people. That's nothing. The university has how many people? Fifty thousand people. Yeah, we have about uh, seventeen thousand students. Seventeen thousand. QUT has fifty thousand students. You can't shake everybody's hand there. But in Bhutan, we can and we must. And I don't just mean shaking hands. I mean interacting. You don't really need to shake hands, but interacting and understanding <coughs> the hopes and aspirations, <coughs> the fears of each and every individual. And this is why His Majesty the King travels from village to village to village. This is why I try to travel from village to village to village and to meet everybody. My constituency has 3,000 registered voters. During our last election, 2,100 voted. 2,100 people voting for me. And then I'm the Prime Minister now. <laughs> <coughs> the Foreign Minister's constituency, Limbu Tamchu's constituency, 800 voters. Just 800 voters. And he's the foreign minister now. <laughs> so the opportunity is that we can interact. This is why we can shake hands. And we must shake hands. And for Australians who might want to visit Bhutan, we can offer to shake hands. <laughs> <laughs> With the Bhutanese sense of hospitality, the Bhutanese tradition of being host is so strong and so vibrant and so alive that any Australian who goes to Bhutan will come back a changed person. Any Australian who goes to Bhutan will see the world through different eyes. You can go and track the whole world. And every place has something else to offer. But you come and trek in Bhutan. Australians love the outdoors. If you trek in Bhutan, if you immerse yourself in the Bhutanese culture, I will guarantee you one thing. You will learn something new about yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is a worthwhile yeah, yeah.
but uh, now I'm, I'm living on an ocean away from Bhutan, and the next thing I want to do is visit Bhutan. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that is perhaps the best way for me to end, that uh, you have you have aroused this strong desire inside me, and I think you've done the same thing to everybody else present in this room, to hop on a plane, land somewhere, and go on a helicopter then, and then take a bus, or, or actually better still, track, and find you wherever you are, and go and shake your hand. <laughs> and we will. Thank you very much. Um, really pleased that you, that, that you came and visited us really pleased and honored that you spoke to us. And thank you all for coming and joining us. It is, uh, it is really a good, uh, an excellent endorsement of the interest that, uh, that, that, that this event has garnered, that this room is full. There is actually standing room only. We have a couple of people standing. <laughs> and now, this is not over yet. Uh, there is a reception outside after this where you will have a chance to, uh, to Meet the Prime Minister again, um, mingle with one another, and shake hands. Thank you again. <laughs>